OK. So I'm calling the meeting to order now, um, and I'd like to, of course, welcome every everyone virtually. Um, I think we're coming becoming very adept at um, meeting online, and, and that's been a really a really good thing. And it's been a really good thing for our board, um, especially um, with all the meetings that we've been having, um, basically by special requests. So I really appreciate it. it. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional land of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which is represented by the communities of Saugeen First Nation and Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. We also think of the Métis Nation of Ontario, whose history and people are well represented in Bruce and Gray counties. I have not at this point received any regrets from, um, trust, from trustees of our board. I'm next going to um, look for approval of the agenda that the agenda for the special regular meeting of the board of August 25th, 2020 be approved as printed. Can I have a mover please? And you can just raise your hand in the little monitor thing. So I see a hand, um, in Trustee Thompson and Trustee Boyd John. Um, and all, in favor? And that's approved. Thank you very much. So first off, what I'm going to do, is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest of the one agenda item before you this evening? I see one person's hand up. Um, Marilyn? Do you have um, pecuniary interest tonight? Oh, it just says guest, so I'm confused. Is that you, Marilyn? You're on mute, Mar. Okay, speak, Marilyn. Are you have? Are, do you have? No, an, I have no pecuniary interest. Oh, okay, great. Want to put your hand down then? That would be super because I saw it right away. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to put the motion on the, the floor and I'll re, be requesting somebody to second that motion. Um, OK, so um, so that the Blue Water District School Board approve administration staff to access up to 2% of the board's operating allocation to facilitate the adoption of mitigation measures to keep students and staff as safe as possible. Can I have a seconder for that, please? OK, um, for, uh, Fran, Trustee Morgan. OK, and um, so thank you very much. It's been uh, moved by me initially, and I'd like to um, have uh, our director, uh, Director Wilder, speak first to the motion before you and the report. Thank you, Chair Johnstone. Good evening. We are very pleased to present our reopening plans to trustees this evening. Since our last meeting, the Ministry of Education provided direction to school boards regarding which return to school model they would be adopting. Blue Water District School Board was deemed a non-designated board, which allows for a conventional return to school with regular class sizes and enhanced public health protocols. In our planning, we have been following the advice of our local public health unit and medical officer of health, the ministry's guide to reopening Ontario schools, as well as a recently released policy program memorandum number 164 regarding requirements for remote learning. I would like to acknowledge the senior team members and other staff who have tirelessly gone above and beyond during these unprecedented times to prepare the plan and detailed protocols. I would like to express my deepest gratitude and thanks for the extensive, challenging, thoughtful, collaborative planning that has occurred to prepare for our schools to reopen. The recent buzzword is being able to pivot and demonstrating that flexibility has been instrumental in ensuring our protocols and plans are comprehensive with health and safety being the number one consideration. We have amazing staff, students, trustees, and communities. We are an organization committed to learning today and leading tomorrow. 
We will get through this in what will be a, a historical time in the future. Going forward, we all have roles to play in supporting our staff, students and families. Maslow's hierarchy of needs comes to mind. For many, meeting their basic physiological needs will be imperative, especially around health and safety aspects and mental health and wellness. We can do this and we are prepared to do this. As you know, we've been working very closely with Public Health Unit, which includes Dr. Ara, our local medical officer of health. You may have read his recent media release in which he said, we have a relatively exceptional situation in Gray and Bruce. We achieved high level of prevention of transmission and optimal control over the outbreak in April. And we have continued to maintain this control during the reopening stages. This relatively positive situation will allow us to provide our children with a safe school reopening they deserve. This is an extremely positive message for our area. As trustees are aware, our planning has had to shift at times. Our board report sent out for tonight's meeting will be accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation, which includes more in-depth information. This information has been fluid, revised as of today, and now includes the most up-to-date information and data available. Our protocols have been called living documents for that very reason. I will now turn it over to the senior team for their presentation, uh, beginning with uh, Superintendent Cynthia Lemon. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, and I'll just wait for the PowerPoint to come up. Our uh, very helpful Superintendent Callahan is the queen of technology in this regard. So uh, thank you very much uh, to our director for her kind words and introduction. And I would like to echo um, the thanks to staff and uh, to the community and parents who are anxious but uh, working to forge forward with us to bring students back to school, uh, to the trustees for their support, and also to uh, again to public health um, who have the Dr. Ara and um, Andrea Riley, who is the manager of public health, who's responsible for schools, have been incredibly um, accessible to us to provide support and also very responsive to any questions that we ha may have had. So that's been particularly helpful. Also, thank you to uh, our union leaders who have been working with us and as we attempt to find common ground uh, in a difficult situation in a return to school and their dedication to meeting with us on an ongoing basis to try to, to find the best way to move forward with our students. So if we could move on to the overview um, slide. And some of these slides will look familiar to you. Um, what we have included information that we presented the last time, which is still current and relevant. And we will highlight where there are changes um, based on uh, the, the need to pivot, as Lori would say, based on new information and a direction from public health and the Ministry of Education. So you are aware of the change in the school calendars with three uh, professional activity days, September 1st, 2nd and 3rd. Um, of our work uh, with our school administrators and the work groups that have supported us all the way through the summer in terms of developing our protocols and plans, our work around health and safety, and then as I mentioned, our meetings, ongoing meetings with our union groups, um, both support staff and teaching staff to um, firm up our plan. Um, new information for the trustees this evening will be on the pre-registration survey data uh, that was collected uh, as we asked our parents to pre-register for school. And I believe that Superintendent uh, Hamilton is speaking to this. Thank you, Superintendent Lemon. Um, we were required actually from the ministry to um, collect uh, pre-registration data to kind of get a sense of uh, the students who are planning to 
return so that we could um, plan properly to make sure that we had sufficient resources in place. Um, so our survey asked um, whether students were um, planning to return to the regular school, whether they were transitioning to a new school, whether they were planning to do remote learning, or um, um, whether they were kind of um, perhaps not coming back due to other reasons. Um, connected with this, we had a school mailbox set up for parents where they could ask uh, questions. And so the certainly members of the senior team uh, have been uh, fielding a lot of questions uh, since the survey was posted uh, trying to address the concerns. And you may have said you may have had some uh, questions directed to you as trustees as well. And so thank you for your support in addressing some of those questions. Um, we had uh, around 15,000 uh, responses. Um, we used uh, a, a survey tool to collect the data and survey tools um, it have some limitations. So there is a, uh, a small margin of error with the uh, data that we collected and I'll speak to that in a, in a few minutes. Um, there were some families, for example, that maybe submitted a survey um, saying that they were going to do remote learning and then once the plan came out, changed their mind and so subsequently um, submitted again. So we've certainly tried to take a look at the most uh, recent submission. Um, the data that we have collected has been uh, sent to schools and so uh, school administrators and school staff are now reviewing that data and validating it and they're checking to see if any families maybe missed completing the survey and they'll be reaching out to those families to find out for sure kind of what their intention is for the fall. So Wendy, I'll just ask you to click and open up the survey data. And again, this will be quite small, uh, but I'll try to take you through it. So you can see that, um, can you, are you able to, just gonna make this a little bit bigger for myself, excuse me. Yeah, that's better, thank you, Wendy. Uh, so you can see on here that we had uh, seven, we have 77% of students that are just, they're returning back to their regular school. That's, uh, you know, 13,000 uh, students who, you know, they're, they're coming back to the conventional model. Um, we have uh, about 7% and that's the amount that's in the orange that um, registered as, as new uh, registrations. They put themselves as new registrations. You'll see when we get a little further in the data that um, the majority of those were actually kindergarten registrations. And so although they're certainly new to our systems, they would have been people that we had, uh, we were planning for, we had their names and would have been planning to come in. So some of that was just a misunderstanding of the question. When we were looking at new registrations, we were really trying to find people who are maybe moving into our district uh, that we wouldn't have their name and we were collecting their name just so that we can make sure that we would uh, be able to add them to our roster. Um, we had again about 7% of, of students who were looking at moving to a different school and again some of that data is uh, data that we would have already had. We had uh, certain students who are transitioning uh, maybe they're in a K-2 school like in Concordia and they're transitioning to a, a four to six school um, or they're in a elementary school maybe uh, and they're transitioning to secondary school. So, um, so again, um, some of that would have been data that we would have had, but um, parents filled it in. Uh, and then we had about 10%, uh, 9% there, uh, 1,580 students who um, have indicated that they're interested in remote learning. And so again, um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that a little later on. If we could move to the next one, Wendy, the next. So this takes a look at the, uh, the spread across the grades. Um, so if you look at, for example, uh, the first bar there, that's the number of students in grade one who would re have responded to the student to the survey. So we have um, 1106 who are looking to remain in their same school. We have about 125 grade one students who are looking at uh, remote learning. Um, again, uh, 54 who are new registrations and then 
uh, 23 to have identified that they're moving to a different school. So you can see that that goes across. You've got grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six, grade seven, grade eight. If you take a look at the junior kindergarten there, there you can see the um, the new registrations are quite high. So again, as I said, we would have had probably most of those names of students, but uh, the, just that was a, a, how parents interpreted the uh, survey. I think the interesting thing when you look um, across the grades is that we have a fairly even spread in terms of the remote learning. Um, it's pretty pretty much the same for, for every grade right through to uh, grade 12 and uh, 13 is a little different. We have very few students, uh, but the proportion of students is, uh, is similar. So if you could move to the next slide, Wendy. So this is really the same data, but it's done as a percentage rather than actual numbers. And so if you take a look at the remote um, the, the numbers in gray there and you kind of go across along the chart at the bottom, you can see that um, it you know it ranges between basically between eight and uh, you know it's one school at 10 percent, but you know most of them it's around around nine percent again uh, per grade uh, that uh, have registered for remote learning. And the next slide, Wendy. So this takes a look at the different schools. Um, and again, this is the numbers. So, um, you know, you can take a look at some of the schools that might be in your area. And uh, this is so, you know, the number of students that are returning, uh, the number of students who have decided to go uh, go remote and then um, new registrations and students moving to a different school. Um, so there's a, you know, and, and again, there's a fair amount of uh, of consistency. You know, if you take a look at the size of the school and the, the number of uh, remote uh, students who are choosing to go remote, there are some with that are a little bit a little bit higher, um, but uh, for the most part, it's it's fairly consistent across the schools. Uh, we'll look at the next slide. This takes a look at the similar information in secondary schools. And again, you can see the number of students who have opted for remote in each school and uh, those who are returning to the same school. And uh, we'll move to the next slide. I think that's all of the slides, yes. Um, so we, as I said, this data now is being sent out to the schools uh, to be validated. Uh, I know just looking at some of the data that we did, um, there was certainly some um, uh, repetition. And so, you know, schools are going to be weeding that out. They're going to be checking with any families who maybe are not represented on the lists. Um, and just to just to make sure that we have uh, connected with all of our families. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. Thanks, Paul and uh, Superintendent Penner Lipset will be speaking to the staffing. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. So um, really nothing um, in terms of the slide is new information from our last uh, presentation. So the points have remained the same. We are just um, sort of a little further along in the process at this point. Um, we do we are still working with staff that are requesting accommodations and we um, are uh, working on that process with a number of staff at this time and we are also at this time um, looking at the data that uh, Superintendent Hamilton just presented to focus our attention on staffing for the remote school. So that's a, that's a next step for us and that's where we are in that process. And the last bullet point here around the vacant positions um, created by staff uh, that is also at this point um, we're working through that process and we are determining you know what those vacancies may be and working to get postings uh, ready at this time to go out. Thank you. Thanks Lauren. So trustees may remember that now we are to provide a comprehensive uh, health and safety training uh, session for the um, all of our staff, whether it's uh, in schools or in the board office or at the maintenance shop. Uh, that will be held on um, September the 1st, the first PA day. Sarah Hills, our health and safety op officer, is, is uh, 
has uh, worked on a draft uh, PowerPoint presentation that is um, explicitly around Blue Water District School Board uh, policy and procedure for health and health and safety and our specific protocols. We've been provided with um, a draft PowerPoint from the Ministry of Education, which will we will blue water eyes uh, to uh, include that information for staff as well. And then we understand that there's a further PowerPoint that's coming too. So this this will be a very lengthy and as I said, comprehensive training program for all staff on September the 1st. Uh, what is definitely new is that uh, Dr. Ara had uh, offered uh, his support to have a uh, town hall for parents. So that is being held, I believe it is tomorrow at seven o'clock on Facebook Live, uh, and we appreciate uh, him doing that. He also offered to do um, a Teams forum for our staff. So that will be held on uh, Wednesday, no, Tuesday, September the 1st. Um, it, it is available to 250 staff members and uh, we were up to over 150 yesterday. I did not check the numbers today. Um, people can submit their questions in advance and uh, he will um, address those questions and also take them on the chat uh, during the session, which is about an hour and a half long. And we will video that session as well, and it will be posted to staff and it will be available to the trustees as well. And we can move on to the cleaning protocols. Um, this slide is is the same as the last uh, round, except that uh, Wendy has made it look um, uh, much nicer. So we, we have added the graphics to this. But our cleaning protocols have not changed. There are enhancement to the protocols. The custodians are responsible for the, the school building. Um, the teachers and EAs and ECEs and CYWs are responsible for program materials. Uh, there's uh, the we will be working very explicitly around frequently touched surfaces, which will be cleaned at a minimum of twice daily. And we have continued to work with um, public health and provincial experts in this regard. And I think probably the next slide is similar information, so we could, it deals with soap dispensers and hand sanitizers, and there's been no shift in this regard. We will continue to, um, make sure that those are filled and available to staff and students. Uh, the physical adaptations, uh, there is no uh, real change there either. We have, although I will uh, reinforce that we have advised administrators to be very clear about a drop off and pick up uh, point for parents who are dropping their students off at the school. Um, we're expecting that some parents will choose not to have their students ride the bus, so that may increase the traffic at the school for the drop off and pick up. So principals are certainly currently working on that. The other um, uh, piece that the principals are looking at is the first day planning. Now, because we are now doing the staggered entry, which uh, will be spoken to in a few minutes, that's reducing the number of students at school on the first day, so that will certainly help uh, to get uh, the JK, SKs and grade nines in in a more organized fashion on the first day, and we will build on that on a daily basis. Um, those processes may be unique to each school depending on um, their number of entry and exits and uh, their ability to organize the entry, uh, an organized and calm entry into the school and connecting students with their teachers. Um, but this, as I said, will be made much easier by the, um, the support of the staggered entry for our students. And we'll move on to the timetable and school day ad adaptations. Thank you, Cynthia. This, um, this particular slide, there's some things that are similar to last time, and then there's some things that are new. Uh, the bell times, there's no change there. The recess and lunch we spoke to last time. Uh, the staggered entry, as Superintendent Lemon was just speaking to, this was a 
uh, way, the ministry had spoken to this say, stating that boards could adopt a staggered entry model. And we decided to do that to support our students and find a uh, very, as Superintendent Lemon spoke to, a calm and organized way to bring our students in. And as you can see, it builds on itself. So it brings our youngest learners in the elementary and then our grade nines and secondary in first. And it just allows them to come in, to have more staff that are there to support and also to start learning those routines and they get more days and they get builds as you can see so that they can learn the routines, practice the routines, and then we add in more students as we go. So again, a way to support the health and safety of our students to come up with a way to bring in our youngest or, or um, newest when it comes to grade nine students into our schools and, and work really as a, as a big care team to support them. So that's something that we have put in place. One thing we spoke to last time was cafeterias and we talked about cafeterias and whether we um, we could run them with their running through the protocols. We have received some updated information that some cafeterias will not be open until late September as Chartwell, which is a particular uh, company that runs some of the cafeterias in our schools and they are rev reviewing their protocols and just ensuring that they've got all their protocols in place. And we spoke to bathroom and hygiene breaks. We talk a lot about bathroom and hand hygiene now and all of the things that we talk about and use of common spaces we had spoken to last time. Program and instruction. So this is program and instruction with this within this conventional model. As you know, we're in the conventional model and we're not a designated board. Um, so we are implementing the full Ontario curriculum. Um, and I, we spoke to this last time, but we're including sample lessons on hygiene, care, physical distancing, recess and breaks. So putting things in place in, within the curriculum and practicing within the classroom. What could you do at recess and what could you do at break um, and understanding what the pandemic means? And we had spoken to mental health. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have a full day of instruction, which means 300 minutes. That's normal. That's what we have every year um, is every year they get 300 minutes a day of instruction. So that's what this looks like. We also created and put together and this is part of that great team that that working team over the summer that came together and talked about um, how do we support our administrators, our teachers. So this is a document that was created, but then there's also another document called an action document. And in the action document, it also speaks to things that elementary administrators would do, uh, secondary administrators would do, classroom teachers, specialized classroom teachers like learning resource teachers, EA. So it breaks it all down to give them a give them good support on things that they need to put in place. So. This one speaks to curriculum. I won't go through it all, but just give you some of the highlights. It talks about the curriculum, the 300 minutes. What does that look like? It talks about DPA, really trying to build that DPA into the classroom. Outdoor education, uh, really trying to get the kids outside, as you've probably been reading in all of the different documents that we've received or in the news that getting the kids outdoors is a good idea. Mathematics, we're working on the new uh, revised mathematics curriculum grades one to eight. So we're supporting our uh, teachers in that and we have a PowerPoint that we've created for them that they can review. And then it goes through language. How do we how do we build this in and understanding of the pandemic, the arts? What does that look like within COVID? Um, remote learning, we have created a remote learning guide, which uh, Superintendent Hamilton will speak to later within the remote learning section talks to special education, what does professional learning look like, extracurriculars, what does that look like within COVID, and right down to things like student pictures. So we went through some of this last time, and then we go through the secondary piece. It talks to specialized programs, OEAP, SHSM, hospitality and tourism. So this document was designed with links to help support our staff as they are implementing all of the different um, protocols and things that they're going to do and what school is going to look like when we re-enter. Next, I wanna to speak to the secondary quadmester model. This is a model that has evolved over time. So uh, we've looked at several different things different periods if it's going to be a day one day two it did morph so what you can see here is we do have a quadmester we have four quadmesters and so in one we get periods one and two two you get periods three and four in quadmester three you get periods one and two and then four you get periods three and four 
and it gives you the dates. So when we had originally looked at this, we had thought maybe we would have um, more than one course during the day. Then we looked at because uh, the, the ministry was speaking to the cohorts that were together. We looked at a day one, day two model, but uh, the ministry and the local public health are supporting a week one, week two model. So I'm just going to show you a calendar that we created. So the week one, week two model means that for one week, the students will do period one, and for one, the next week they do period two, and then that alternates between and each quadmester. So in quadmesters one and three, they're doing period one, one week, period two the next week, and then it, it goes through. And it has the exam times in here too. There's exams that are attached to each of the quadmesters. So we've created this for our staff and for our families and our students so that they can see what a quadmester will look like and what a week one and week two model will look like. And again, the week one, week two model, it allows us to really cohort our students and uh, not mingle our cohorts during the day or across a week or within a week. And again, it's supported by the ministry and it's supported by our local public health. Next, uh, Superintendent Penner Lipset is going to speak to the timetable discussions. We've had many, many timetable discussions over many weeks, and she's just going to talk a little bit about what that's looking like at this point. Thank you, Superintendent Colhan. Um, so, as mentioned, we've uh, been in discussions uh, all summer long with our uh, union partners around um, timetables and we're still in discussions at this time uh, even today we were on uh, a call looking at um, a couple different options for timetables so we are working to try and ensure that we are meeting our collective agreement requirements as well as meeting our ministry um, requirements and our instructional uh, requirements, which um, we spoke to the, for example, the 300 minutes of instructional time. So we understand um, that this is a challenge and we have been all working together to make this possible. And um, so we understand that we may not be able to meet all of these um, parameters set out by the ministry and uh, public health and within our collective agreement uh, during this um, these unprecedented and unprecedented times but that is our goal that is what we are trying to do um, we are trying to um, be compliant at with all of those pieces and we are planning um, still to look at timetables further uh, tomorrow morning. So um, that's all that I can bring for an update at this time in terms of um, particular uh, timetable. Thank you. So moving on to special education, um, there is no change in this slide and the next one. Um, the, the highlight that I would make is in regard to the plan for the additional transition time. Uh, Melissa McEwen, who is our new learning services administrator, she uh, replaced Blair Hiltz, who has just retired. Um, she has sent out information to all of our administrators outlining a plan for supporting our students with special education needs to transition back into school. It provides for some budget for teachers and or educational assistants to come into the school before the beginning of the school year uh, to work directly with students uh, in whatever unique way is needed uh, in order to facilitate their return. Um, we understand that that we don't have quite um, enough dollars to be able to support every child, so the school is prioritizing based on need, and that will occur over the next week and a half. But everything else on those two slides is the same. And then moving on to mental health and well-being, um, 
these are uh, really uh, consistent from the last presentation as well. What is new is that the School Mental Health Ontario uh, has uh, produced and released a toolkit of supports and resources. It's a, uh, an amazing uh, piece of work that will help um, not only system leaders and school leaders, but our educators, our support staff, students, and parents and families. Our mental health lead, Reen Langan, is working with Melissa McEwen again uh, to determine uh, the best uh, kind of professional development for our staff, and that will occur um, on uh, one of those three PA days. And then we'll release all of these materials out to the system, including in some way, shape or form to parents and families to provide support to them. And uh, this is all geared um, to support people in reducing their anxiety using things like mindfulness to be able to focus on the return in a calm and relaxed way uh, and to be able to be in school and working or learning. Uh, Lauren is going to um, speak to the uh, personal protective equipment. Thank you. Just uh, on my screen, I'm just waiting for it to switch. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm still on the mental health slide, but I can I can start and it will catch up. Uh, in in terms of the PPE. Um, there is not a lot of change. As you can see, we don't have um, highlights here, but just wanted to um, reiterate that it is arriving uh, daily at this point. So um, PPE has been uh, distributed and schools are receiving orders and um, we are just checking in with schools to ensure they are uh, receiving you know, what they ordered at this time. And uh, and everything at this point is on track. Thanks, Lauren. And then uh, similar in the cleaning supplies delivery, uh, those are also arriving in these bulk orders daily in the school. Um, what is new and uh, just was confirmed um, in, in the last little bit is that uh, Bruce Power reached out to us and made an offer uh, of supplies to us. So we will be receiving a shipment of masks and hand sanitizer that can be distributed um, to the schools as needed um, um, across the system. So we are grateful to them uh, for their support of us. Um, the outbreak protocol, there's nothing new here um, since our last presentation. However, we are aware that the Ministry of Education will be providing us with um, a, a, an outbreak protocol that is provincial in nature. They would like these to be consistent across the province um, from board to board and public health unit to public health unit. I'm not really anticipating anything uh, too different from what you can see on that particular slide, uh, but we are waiting for further uh, communication from the ministry and uh, certainly boards have reiterated the need to have that sooner rather than later. Um, just an update in health and safety. Sarah Hills has worked diligently around the issue of signage and uh, that signage is uh, being uh, collated now to send out to schools and will be up on doors and in classrooms and in washrooms very shortly. But there's nothing else new on that slide. And then uh, Paul and Wendy um, will speak to remote learning. Thank you, Superintendent Lemon. Um, so we, as you saw in the data earlier, we have uh, over 1,500 students who have are, are opting for uh, remote learning. Um, about, um, you know, I think uh, three between three and 400 of those students are in secondary, and the remainder are in elementary. Um, so we are 
looking at uh, staffing, setting up staffing. So the remote learning students who are engaged in remote learning, it'll be um, run uh, like a separate school. Um, the program will be taught by teachers who are just doing the remote learning. That's the thinking at the, and that will will use staff who are not able to. Um, uh, be in the schools, uh, perhaps they're immunocompromised or they have a family member. And so we're looking at using some of those staff who have been kind of self-identifying um, that they're not able to come in. Um, it's looking like we will probably need um, about 20 secondary teachers and um, in between 50 and 60 elementary school teachers. Um, so uh, we have um, we're using some existing system staff as to function as uh, principals for this remote learning school, and they will be setting up the classrooms and assigning students uh, to teachers. And then those teachers uh, will be re uh, reaching out to uh, the students to, to make the connections and get uh, the uh, remote school, remote uh, learning school up and running. Um, we have these students uh, scheduled in our staggered entry to start on the Friday on the 11th of August. I mean September, excuse me. Um, and um, we, if you want to just click, so Wendy mentioned earlier that we've established a remote learning guide and this is to support uh, uh, the remote, remote learning teachers and principal. Um, so uh, most of this material is taken directly out of the ministry guidance document. I'll just highlight a couple of pieces. I mean, it certainly defines synchronous learning, which is really live uh, presentation. Um, so that's where a teacher is interacting directly with a group of students. And then we have the asynchronous learning where it's not delivered in real time. Um, it may be um, uh, a video that is available for them to view on their own time, or it may be some work that's assigned to students. Um, we are required, uh, students are required to engage in learning for 300 minutes uh, a day, 300 minutes of learning opportunities available to them. Um, and then down a little bit further, the ministry developed a chart in terms of what the expectations are around synchronous, so that real-time live learning. Uh, so for kindergarten, you can see that it's 180 minutes. Now this is the amount of time that a teacher is expected to provide live synchronous learning to the students. That doesn't necessarily mean that a, an individual student is involved in 180 minutes of live uh, learning. So the, the in a kindergarten class, you may have a, part of that may be a session with all of the students. So you maybe have a 20 or 30 minute session with all of the students. And then the teacher might elect to do some small group work to support uh, individual students, maybe in developing their letters or you know their understanding of mathematical concepts. And so they might have a small group that they're working with for you know 20 minutes and then another group and then another group. So an individual student uh, might be involved certainly in the whole group sessions and then in the, you know, one or two small group sessions during the day and then they'll have some some asynchronous work uh, maybe that they can be doing some practice work that they can be doing so you can see that uh, that increases for the expectations in terms of grades one to three but it's again it's that same idea there will be some whole class uh, ex, you know presentations but there'll be some small group work as well so um, that means that students don't necessarily have to sit in front of that computer all day long um, and that, but the total of it does need to add up to uh, the 300 minutes. In course for secondary, it's uh, it's either 300 minutes per day for a full course, or um, 75 minutes, you know, per day for um, if you know for each individual course. Um, there is a, an option for parents to, uh, who don't want their children to participate in synchronous learning for them to do that. Um, and we've developed um, a, a, a form that they would submit and will it'll be reviewed. Um, those students then would be provided with some uh, asynchronous uh, learning opportunities. Um, or, you know, so perhaps uh, they wouldn't be participating in the live sessions, but maybe some of the uh, learning has been uh, taped and they can kind of watch the tape or there'll be some, um, you know, some of the assignments that the teacher has created for the students to do. So they're not necessarily participating in all the, all the synchronous learning. 
Um, so the, you know, there's some some uh, direction around communication. Uh, certainly, we, as I mentioned last time, we're standardizing our platform. The teachers will use either the Brightspace or the uh, full Microsoft Suite. So something like this that we're using today, the Teams meeting, um, is available to them. And there's a similar. Um, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, the words get me, but they're similar, similar in uh, Brightspace called Bongo, which allows for, again, a live presentation just like the Teams. And, uh, and we will be doing a differentiated assessment and instruction, finding out where the students are at and where they need to go. And then there will be uh, ongoing supports for students with special education needs. And, um, and we'll be monitoring student attendance and safety as we would. And so there are there certainly ministry expectations uh, related to all of that. Um, one of the things we'll be doing with the students is using the um, the uh, ISTE guides, the, which is uh, the International Society for Technology in Education, and that'll be, uh, again, for helping students, uh, you know, learn about uh, safety online and about digital citizenship. Um, we can maybe move on to the next slide, uh, Wendy. So this speaks again to some of the things we've already talked about, 300 minutes a day, the programming. So I think we've covered all of this. It'll be a mix of that guided instruction, you know, some asynchronous and independent work and so on. So we'll maybe move on to the next one, Wendy. Um, I know that there were a lot of questions generated around uh, secondary and the course options that are available. Obviously, there are multiple course options available at secondary school, and um, we didn't... We, we, we have a number of options available to us. Uh, obviously, we can't offer the same full range that we would uh, if students were attending face-to-face uh, -face and where we've got schedules already set up and staff. Um, so, but there are some options. Uh, we posted on, there are a number of what we call uh, modular learning courses, which are independent learning courses, which may be um, uh, an option for some students. Um, there are some e-learning courses and we belong to a consortium of uh, e-learning uh, it's called the Ontario e-learning consortium where um, boards uh, who are a part of it and I think there are 11 or 12 um, they are if they have empty seats in their e-learning courses. So for example, if they're offering an e-learning course and it has a, maybe a maximum number of students or 25, and they've only been able to fill it with 13 students in their board, um, students from other boards can go in and fill those seats. So that really helps uh, boards to make sure that their classes are full, uh, that they're not running courses that are you know, par only partially full. So that's you know, good economics. So if we have a course in Blue Water that we're offering, if they're a math course, for example, and you know, only 20, uh, students had signed up and there were still five available seats, students from another board could come in and fill those seats. Likewise, if there are courses in, you know, offered by other board that we maybe wouldn't be offering to our students that are available uh, as e-learning courses, um, our students could sign up for those. So it really creates uh, new opportunities for students. These courses are offered asynchronously, so they're, they're not, uh, they don't have a live um, um, uh, synchronous uh, element to them. So we have the modular independent learning courses available to students. We have these e-learning courses, which will have a limited number of seats the students might be able to access. And then we're taking a look at, again, the students who have signed up for remote learning, and we're um, looking at uh, setting up some blue water courses in some of the core subject area uh, compulsory subjects so some of the math and english and maybe the social sciences that uh, students have to get so this would be particularly important for you know our students in grade uh, 9 and 10 where there's a limited number of e-learning courses and there's a limited number of uh, uh, independent modular learning options and so we'll make sure we'll work with guidance teachers uh, at the schools uh, to find the best possible uh, pathway for students and set up the courses based on those needs. Uh, that was a difficult thing to do in advance and we didn't know kind of what the distribution was going to be. You know, students who would be needing applied level courses or students who would be needing academic level courses. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, 
had our data, knew what we needed, and set it up uh, based on the needs. So the remote learning school principals will be working with guidance staff in the schools to uh, help identify those courses, and then we'll be uh, and working with the students to reach out to make sure that they're getting uh, what they need. Um, I think that's all for me. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so the students with special needs, uh, there is no change really here from um, the last uh, committee of the whole meeting. I will point out that we do have um, a few students with special education needs whose parents have chosen to have them working and learning from home remotely. Uh, so the system team um, in collaboration with the school team will be working directly with parents and the care team of those uh, children to be able to provide unique supports to them, uh, which would include such things as um, assistive technology where required. We are not in a position to be able to put EA staff or CYW staff in students' homes. So this all will have to be provided as um, a virtual uh, learning uh, system. Um, with the mental health and well-being, again, we'll have the School Mental Health Ontario materials available to us and provide support to staff and students in that regard. Uh, we also have our mental health lead, our uh, mental health workers and our um, and nurses that work in the elementary panel, the mental health and addiction nurses. We do believe that we are going to have some funding that will be directly related to providing su uh, support to students with mental health needs in the early years primary. Uh, so as soon as that is um, clearly delineated with the expectations, then we will make a decision around how to best use that with additional staff. Um, to support in the schools. Um, and that would move us on to the access to technology. And I think, Paul, you're speaking to that. Yes, thank you, uh, Superintendent Lemon. Um, again, as I mentioned uh, previously, all of our staff who are teaching the remote learning are going to be working with either Brightspace or the Office 365 suite. Um, teachers will, who are providing online instruction uh, will be provided with a computer device. Um, normally, we, if we had a teacher, for example, in elementary who had a less than a 50 percent um, uh, um, teaching um, assignment, uh, they would not necessarily be assigned a computer, but obviously if you're going to be teaching online, you need to have a computer. So we'd be making sure that those teachers um, are supplied with a computer. Um, and all administrators uh, obviously have a computer already to support um, the learning. Um, we had, as part of our survey, we asked uh, families if they had access to a computer or if they had access to internet. So when we look at the students who have opted for remote learning, we had about 250 uh, families that identified that um, they would need support with a device. Uh, we're able to provide one device per family. Uh, we recognize that that'll be a challenge in families that have um, you know, multiple uh, children in multiple grades. Um, but, um, we had about 100 families who identified that they needed some assistance with internet. Um, and we, I think I mentioned at our last uh, meeting that we have the MiFi devices, and these are devices that it's a kind of a stick that we can give to families, and it'll allow them to um, get an internet connection through the uh, telephone. Uh, uh, through the telephone system, they can connect to uh, the telephone signals that are available in their area. So it still may not be perfect for um, families, but it will uh, provide some support to to families who maybe don't have uh, who don't have uh, internet. Um, so our remote learning principals will work with uh, the families who have opted for remote learning just to make sure that they are set up and that they have uh, they're, they're able to access the online learning. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Lemon. Thanks, Paul. And moving on to professional learning, Wendy, I think. That's all been covered and we're on to professional learning. Sorry. 
So we'll move on to school readiness, and I think that's Superintendent Cummings. Thanks, Superintendent Lemon. Uh, we'll start with school readiness, and certainly um, our plant staff, custodial and maintenance workers have been very busy this summer. Our schools have been professionally cleaned uh, in preparation of the start of school. Part of our summer work is equipment and structure maintenance. Uh, completed a number of schools, and this is coming to a completion now, and those schools will be ready to go. And this is part of our regular maintenance all of, at all of our schools. <clears throat> You'll see the uh, third point there, HVAC systems are monitored, inspected regularly. Uh, this is an item that uh, Blue Water has been taking care of over many years. So when we plan our renewal work each year, certainly there's a number of older systems that are replaced with newer systems. And there has been a number of questions and uh, items in the media with regards to HVAC. Um, I did have a question about uh, providing portable ventilation systems in our classrooms uh, and what that would look like. And I'll, I'll talk to you about some reasons about that, uh, around that, about why that's not required. Uh, but just to answer some of the questions I had, if you look at the fact that Blue Water has about 850 classrooms, uh, given that they're about 700 square feet, a separate portable ventilation system probably is running between anywhere from $700 to $800. Uh, you'd be looking at a total cost of you know somewhere between uh, five fifty and six hundred eighty thousand dollars. So it's it's a big expenditure uh, for something that's not really required, <clears throat> and it's not a requirement uh, because if a building has a correctly sized HVAC system operating well, like the schools in Blue Water, uh, then adequate ventilation exists throughout the whole building, even in rooms without windows, uh, because of the ventilation uh, physical ventilation system. We know our HVAC systems are working well. These are monitored regularly through a central um, electronic inspect, uh, system. They're inspected annually and reported to the Ministry of Education on a regular basis. Also, as I mentioned, every summer, our renewal plans for the past number of years have included the replacement of some of our older systems with new updated HVAC systems and the latest technology. Our schools have sound ventilation systems. And yes, if there was an issue for some strange reason, uh, windows would be the proper risk mitigation or recursive action to take um, and minimize use of interior rooms. So that's what we would say about the HVAC systems at this point. Again, all the equipment is maintained and updated at regular intervals, uh, both from the system level monitoring and from physical uh, uh, presence of, of um, plant staff in the schools. Uh, next slide, please. And a little bit of update from the transportation slide you saw last. So of course, we're looking at full daily routes now for 325 buses. And that's in order to provide the capacity to transport our students under the conventional model. As you can imagine, there are some challenges and limited options for the physical distancing. So other risk mitigation measures are in place, such as we're asking our students and families to self-assess our students uh, prior to getting on the bus and looking at if there's symptoms. Reminders to wash our hands before getting on the bus. Um, some requirements for grades 4 to 12 to wear masks. Uh, we're also asking our students not to sit in the seat directly behind the bus driver. We're asking them to sit together with their siblings and if no siblings, load the bus one student per seat until all seats are occupied by a student. Try to sit near students in your class. Uh, once all the bus seats are occupied by one student, start adding additional students to each seat until seats have two students, and then three students or until all students have been picked up. Uh, buses will be marked. Uh, row numbers will be assigned visibly in the bus. And students are asked to remember what row they sit in for contact tracing purposes. And we'll get some help from, uh, from our schools on that as well. Uh, and students should sit in the same seat each day as part of the seating plan uh, for the above point there. And again, because this is a coterminous service uh, for both boards, we're happy to say we're aligned for the return to school and our, and our bus scheduling going forward. In terms of bus cleaning, uh, sorry, next slide. Um, regular bus cleaning as per our protocol, high touch surface areas cleaned after the morning and afternoon runs. And uh, those would include such as the inside hand railing, the back of seat backs, top of seat backs, front, uh, seat bench, bus walls below the window, um, and all high touch surfaces will be disinfected at the end of the AM run and high touch surfaces one to three will clean on the PM runs. 
uh, driver seat and controls will also be. Uh, part of this is also our uh, driver training. So our bus operators will be providing driver training uh, for all of this as they go forward. Um, that being said, as part of our risk mitigation, if drivers are experiencing symptoms uh, of COVID, uh, they will not be driving and therefore there could be driver shortages. So of course we do ask our parents as we do every year uh, to please check my uh, BruceGraySchoolBus.ca for daily updates to your routes uh, and any cancellations to the routes. So uh, that's kind of how that is looking right now. Um, the bus interior surfaces are to be cleaned with a disinfectant uh, on the list and uh, they will document their disinfection protocol. Sorry, the operators will document their disinfection protocol um, as they go through it. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that's back to you, Cynthia. Thanks, Rob. Um, so Jamie will speak uh, to any update for the communication plan. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you very much, Superintendent Lemon, and good evening, everybody. Well, the world of communication certainly keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. Uh, I assume most, if not all of you, have had a chance to visit our dedicated Return to School webpage. Uh, this is essentially a repository for all things related to our protocols for the September startup. Uh, as you may have noticed, we have two very extensive Q&As, which are divided into two categories. So we have school operations and also program and instruction. Now, as Director Wilder said earlier, we have become quite accustomed to terms such as pivoting and living document. Well, I will say that our uh, newly acquired <coughs> skill of having to regularly pivot has resulted in continuous updates to our Q&A which we do call a living document. So in addition to the web pages, we also have downloadable PDF versions uh, where we revise the date every time there are changes. So uh, parents or any visitors to our website can certainly download and print those versions. Uh, as schools reopen, we will also uh, strategically pull out and highlight uh, certain key areas from those uh, Q and A's. So for example, as schools get set to reopen, um, for example, the daily screening questionnaire for students and visitors, that's something that we'll pull out and highlight uh, more visibly on our website and, of course, use our uh, social media platforms as well. And speaking of which, uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, continue to play uh, an important role in our communication strategy. Of course, traditional media, I will say, they've been very responsive to our various parent letters and other communications. We do try to keep uh, close dialogue with our media partners. And uh, as a matter of fact, we are already setting up some dates for Chair Johnstone and Director Wilder to appear on Politically Speaking on Rogers TV uh, to talk about uh, the return to school plan and uh, what we're doing in relation to uh, COVID-19 and protocols and such. Uh, there's also been frequent communication uh, behind the scenes with our local uh, MPP's office. So often they will contact us if they receive questions from constituents. So we help to provide some clarification from a board perspective. And uh, just like we do with media, always trying to strengthen those relationships and um, help to facilitate communication wherever we can. Now, as uh, Superintendent Hamilton mentioned, uh, the return to school centralized mailbox. Now, we did set this up during the pre-registration survey period and also to support parents when we initially rolled out our Q&A. So I actually just wanted to extend uh, big kudos to the superintendents on the planning team who pitched in during an especially busy time for uh, all of them to respond to uh, what I'll say, uh, several hundred inquiries and checking the archives. It was certainly within that range. And uh, despite everything that was going on, um, you know, working around the clock to get to those inquiries and uh, answer and, and direct responses as best as possible. Well, now that uh, many school administrators are back in their buildings, we're actually um, trying to direct a lot of the communication and parents to their schools. And as we do that, of course, supporting principals with messaging and getting them set up uh, with using school messenger again. Uh, as I referenced at our last meeting over the summer, we uh, supported principals by centrally sending our various communications through school messenger. So now as schools start back up again, um, we're kind of turning that back over to the principal, though of course supporting them as always. Uh, Superintendent Lemon, she indicated that we have been working very closely with Graber's Public Health and uh, they continue to provide resources and support for the return to school. Uh, as mentioned, there's the Facebook Live public event with Dr. Era tomorrow evening. And uh, of course, our very own Dr. Wilder will be one of the guests. Uh, next week, Dr. Air will actually be our guest for an internal virtual session, uh, specifically for board staff. 
and we are going to be recording that session to make available afterwards for uh, any staff who are unable to attend, but also offering the opportunity ahead of time for all staff, whether they uh, attend or not. Uh, they can submit their questions ahead of time and we'll share those with Dr. Era for the, uh, the virtual session and recording. Uh, just a few other uh, minor things. As I had mentioned during my update at our last meeting, Public Health are also exploring some options to support all of the local school boards with some resources that we can make available to assist parents in understanding uh, the various protocols. We certain, certainly look forward to continuing to work with them on some of those items. Uh, speaking of which, we're actually uh, working with some members of our learning services team to develop an in-house narrated video, which will be targeted targeted to uh, students and parents. So this will basically familiarize them with what the return to school will look like. And uh, we're rec recruiting some of our very own student volunteers and actually using one of our uh, schools for our video shoot, keeping in mind physical distancing and all of those protocols, of course. Um, the, uh, the intent is to shoot the video this week and we'll have that available in the very near future. Uh, some other school boards have uh, worked on uh, similar type videos, so we thought it would make sense to provide a blue waterized version, uh, which will include uh, some of the co common topics, though uh, providing some visuals and uh, demos on items such as entering and exiting, uh, hallway protocols, hand hygiene, lunch recess, and all of those sorts of items. So uh, certainly looking forward to that as well. So uh, as, as I'm sure you can tell, there's certainly lots on the go as we use our various platforms, uh, methods, and of course, different forms of media to expand their communications reach during this uh, especially uh, difficult time. But uh, as always, we refine and pivot as we move along. So that is communications in a nutshell. Thanks very much, Jamie, and uh, I'll pass it back to Rob, and I believe Andrew Lowe is providing some support as well. Thanks, Cynthia. Yes, Andrew's with me here. Uh, we're going to uh, split this up a little bit between us, um, and we'd like to keep it in a nutshell, but uh, we know uh, we know there's a lot uh, a lot to absorb here. So, uh, a little bit of a repeat. You've seen this slide uh, in our previous uh, presentation. Uh, we showed you that the two timelines before. This time we're just going to show you the uh, projected annual cost going forward. Um, we talked about decreased revenue because of the situation that we're currently in. Uh, the budget impact in a conventional return. Uh, we have the estimate of technology costs for students choosing to work uh, go to school remotely, PPE, supplies and cleaning costs. We talked about the decrease in international student revenue, although uh, we have had some sign up for remote learning and uh, would not foresee any incremental busing costs except for the odd bit of cleaning. Again, uh, that may be covered off by, uh, by minister, ministry funding. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Andy here for the uh, budget impact and, and possible learning models. Uh, go ahead, Andy. Thank you, Rob. Uh, if you recall, on July 28th, we did present uh, the budget impact considerations for three possible learning models. Uh, with the announcement of the conventional return, the budget impact uh, is estimated at approximately $2 million. Um, since the announcement, we have considered costing implications of different <laughs> scenarios, one of which was reducing class sizes in kindergarten and primary grades to 15 to 1, and junior and secondary classes to 20 to 1 student to teacher ratios. Uh, in order to move in that direction, an additional 215 classroom teacher FDE would be required at a cost of approximately $18.5 million. Um, this is without considering costs related to capacity to accommodate more classes, uh, support staff, or other incremental costs. So as, you, uh, as such, uh, the qualitative and quantitative hurdles are extreme in, in that direction. Um, next slide, please. So this table uh, you saw in, on July 28th as well, This it details a $2 million cost associated with the conventional return based on what we know so far. Uh, other details and cost subsections are sure to arise. Uh, some of which will be offset or partially offset by specific funding, and some will ultimately be absorbed by the board. One consideration to keep in mind is the cost of technology. You'll notice that technology requirements are substantially lower in the conventional model than others. However, 
this number could grow as we determine how many students opt for virtual learning and their individual needs. Next slide, please. Uh, since our last presentation, the ministry has released various funding allocations to support school reopenings and to respond to COVID-19. Uh, this table here shows a list of um, items that and uh, that are funding different uh, different areas of response. Uh, some are projections based on enrollment share and are subject to change. Uh, we're always uh, looking at an additional $2 million in funding to support staffing, PPE, and cleaning supplies, additional supports for mental health and special education, as well as money to, to support remote learning through technology and centralized leadership. Next slide, please. Uh, beyond what we know now, there are some additional funding considerations. Uh, the first note reads that $40 million in funding has been announced to support enhanced cleaning protocols and student transportation with allocation details to follow. Well, this afternoon we did receive some further information uh, whereby $20 million will be released immediately to boards so that transportation consortia uh, have the resources to address pressures that may emerge. Uh, this allocation is proportionate to the 2021 transportation grant, resulting in $285,000 for Blue Water and an additional $88,000 for the coterminous board. At 325 buses, this works out to approximately $1,150 a bus. Uh, once the cost recovery mechanism is determined at the ministry level, information regarding the additional $20 million will be released. But we are hopeful that our funding will at least surpass $2,000 per bus, uh, which is to say our costs will likely be beyond that. The cost recovery mechanism is still under construction, but basically the ministry is centrally procuring PPE and cleaning supplies and details of actual allocations to separate boards is yet to be determined. Staff will continue to monitor ministry communication and adjust funding expectations as required. And I'll pass it over to Rob for the remainder. Thanks, Andy. Um, so as we know, as somewhat related to our motion this evening, the ministry has authorized school boards to use their accumulated surplus. Uh, in an effort to provide flexibility for the purpose of augmenting the health and safety of school reopening plans. So certainly, as we know from our budget uh, process in June, we do have some risk management reserves available uh, that do fall within the ministry guidelines that have been uh, that have been laid out. Um, I'll remind you that uh, Blue Water's reserves have been built over a number of years after a tremendous amount of hard work uh, to write our financial position over the years by our trustees and staff. Um, these reserves were intended to be used for other high needs, such as upgrading facilities and supplementing other inadequate funded funding for facility renewal. And if you recall our budget process in June, this created the opportunity to have flexibility going forward um, in terms of how we uh, how we use these uh, contingency funds. Uh, so while we may be able to use some of these reserves, uh, we do need to be conservative in our thoughts and in our use, and we may need to think about uh, more of a less of a short term use and more of a long term use in terms of how what is our concerning needs. Um, the short the short of that is I do not suggest that we go and spend you know five million dollars prior to September. That would be uh, impossible. We we need to look at this from more of a, a mid term to longer term view. Um, we're certainly appreciative of the fact that we have our monthly business committee meetings with their trustees and we'll be bringing spending information uh, for their for their review and their oversight uh, in terms of the use of reserves going forward. Uh, and we look forward to those meetings with our trustees and, uh, and moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so obviously we're going to consider and monitor our costs associated with the, uh, the return and uh, the ministry funding announcements. So uh, as we're preparing for this evening's meeting, we get the transportation memo on the, the extra funding available there. So, so we are really um, 
I'm not sure what the word is beyond hopeful, but certainly we are counting on the ministry uh, and all the other organizations, the trustee organizations, our trustees, other school boards, our director associations, um, in working with the ministry uh, to help develop a cost uh, recovery model for our school boards to go forward. Um, that being said, it is also good that we have some leeway with our flexible contingency reserves going forward. So as usual, we will continue uh, to manage effectively in a balanced and flexible long-term approach. Uh, but most importantly is the support um, and well-being of our students and our staff going forward over this pressing time. Uh, I will leave it at that at this point in time. And uh, I believe that concludes. If I can just say one thing and thank you very much, Robin, to the team for the presentation. I, I have been in education a particularly long time now and faced a number of challenges over the years in a number of different roles. But I have to say that uh, there has been no challenge bigger than this and that I feel privileged and honored to work in this board with this particular team, knowing that the students and staff are well cared for and that the, the dedication and commitment um, does us well for our startup on September the 8th. So thank you to the trustees and we're happy to take any questions. Excuse me, it's Jan. So I was looking at the chat and there's been some different different questions that have been put in put in there. So I'm gonna kind of scroll up. Jen, I've those. been keeping track of it. Jennifer okay. has the first one. Okay. Followed by Fran and Katie, and I had a question too. And then okay. Jennifer had another one. Okay, so um, okay, I'm not going to be able to. I'm just. I'm going to sc scrolling up. I need to do that just so I know. Um, so Jennifer had the first question. So go ahead, Jennifer. So just I was and this is in context of how this quadmester period one, one week, et cetera, would work. So my question was, say hypothetically, if period one was gym, so they would do that all day, every day for a week. And then the next week do the next period. Like um, I think that that might be quite a challenge for some students. The chat. Uh, oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. No, that's okay. You're on. Thank you. Yes, we've been having discussions actually with our administrators too, and we also will with our um, with our teachers and just talking about what that might look like. And we've been talking specifically. It's that's a good example around gym and just what that might look like. So in phys ed, we have different kinds of phys ed courses in secondary. Some are personal fitness courses, and we have other types of leadership courses. So we've talked about how much time you would spend in the gym, how much time you might spend outside doing certain activities, how much time you would be doing health, because we have specific health rooms that they will use, and then uh, personal fitness if they have their fitness rooms. So they're looking at how do you break up that day and what does that look like and the goals that the students would set. So it's really working with the teachers and the administrators on what that day can look like because we understand of course it's very different to have the same course all day and so and no, no matter what course you're in we have to talk and, and work with our administrators and our teaching staff to say how do you work this up so you're putting it into chunks and you're working through it with the students and they'll take a lot of their guide too from the students and and support them but yes we understand that one day one course each day really will have to look at how you deliver the course and how you support the kids and chunk the learning yeah because the even the sort of the history of the research around the cognitive ability to retain the information depending at what sort of academic level that that will be challenging if it's continually just one subject without diversifying that. So I'm glad to hear that. That's actually helpful that the plan is to sort of break that up into chunks. So thank you. And I also see that uh, Director um, Wilder would like to speak. Go ahead. Uh, I would just thank you very much, Chair Johnstone. And in response to Trustee Miller's question, uh, we too were concerned about the pedagogical aspects of this kind of learning. So we've been really focusing on that 
This is in response to the ministry directly being concerned about indirect contacts. And that was uh, the conversation that we had with the ministry late uh, on Friday last week. And so the concept is that the week about, uh, one week on, of course, one week off would limit the indirect contacts. And our local medical officer of health also supports that. So um, we are doing our best to work with our administrators to ensure that it's a, a dynamic learning experience for students who will be in a class uh, for that week's period. The next question I had was from Fran, Jen. Okay, go ahead, Fran. Trustee Morgan. Trustee Thank Morgan. you. <laughs> Thank you, chairs. Um, <laughs> I would just like to uh, comment, um, and I don't have a question at this point. I'd like to say how much I appreciate the work that the staff has done. Um, I have been trying to watch the reports of Minister Lecce on television and I don't think you've been pivoting Laurie I think you have been twirling um, to keep up with all the changes that have come through um, I am perfectly um, willing to support this motion um, however I take to heart what uh, um, Mr. Cummings said about how hard we worked to put this money together. However, we were putting it together for a rainy day. And um, I think um, perhaps with um, some prudent use, the, the rainy day has come that we should use some of the money. So thank you, that's my comment for the evening. Okay, th and thank you. That was a great comment, Trustee Morgan. Um, okay, so I have Katie next. Go ahead, um, Katie. <laughs> I just forgot your last name. That's okay, yes. thank you. I have a few questions, so if you can just put me at the end of the list after this one, that would be great. My first question is about busing. And in our previous meeting, we had spoken about seating plans on the buses. And I know many of my daughter's bus drivers have used seating plans. And from everything I have read from public health in, you know, the other half of my life, um, seating plans would likely be much more prudent than a seating protocol. Have seating plans been taken off the table for what's being done? Come on. Uh, what I presented, Trustee Roots, was the, uh, <coughs> was the seating plan. So at this point, we do not know who is showing up on the bus. Because um, first, first, what I didn't put, present was the first step of risk mitigation on a bus is, you know, the buses are optional to our students. Um, they don't have to take the bus. However, for those that do, we don't necessarily know who's going to be on the bus right now. So to assign them to a seat um, wouldn't actually work out. So the seating plan is the first day when we pick them up, they will be sitting in a seat and that will be their seat on the seating plan going forward. And the next day when more kids are picked up, uh, that's how we will develop the plan. So the seating plan will be a little bit dynamic the first week, but as we get into the second week, uh, it will become more, more firm. Are you okay with that, Katie, with the answer? <laughs> I, I guess I'm just confused because I understand not knowing who will all show up, except that there is a list of stops to make. So we should have an idea of who will be there and who will be in the same family and in the same school. And the like and also how I interpreted the presentation was that students would be asked to remember their seat number not that they would be assigned to a seat so superintendent Cummings can you just can clarify that for me thank you 
I guess I would ask for the clarification on if we assign a student to a seat, how do they remember that that's their seat number? It's the same question to me. What we're planning on doing, every bus that's running will have a manifest of all the students and all the stops it has to pick up and drop off. Many times a bus will show up at a pickup site and there'll be no students there. In fact, many days, if not all days, most buses run at about 75% of the assigned capacity. Uh, we're not expecting that to change too much. Um, so the seating plan to go forward is on day one, we're going to pick up a SK student. They're going to get on the bus and sit in 2A, if you will, and that will be their seating plan starting going forward, and they will be asked to sit in 2A again. The bus driver, in conjunction with some school staff, uh, will work on the bus manifest and that to move forward. But to tell that student they're going to sit in 2A prior to the bus showing up, and they don't show up on the bus. Now we have an empty seat and there's other kids sitting two to a seat. It's really not practical at that point. If we're better off to, to fill up those seats as opposed to saying, oh, the person didn't show up, we're holding it for them at this point in time. Uh, so we're trying to get this through the most practical means possible, um, but there will be a seating plan uh, that's related to the actual students who get on the bus over the first week and two weeks. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on. Um, and Trustee Thompson, you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. We talk about our high school students choosing to be in person or remote, but I know some of our small schools count on both options to fulfill the requirements for what they hope to accomplish. Can they be both in this model? I can uh, try to address that question. Um, I mean, certainly students have, have always had the option to take uh, e-learning courses and, uh, and those students will have already signed up for those courses in our board in terms of their selection. If there are seats uh, in the e-learning, um, you know, we can, there will be some opportunities for students to take those. So, those are certainly those could be accessible by a student who is maybe taking um, uh, a course at school and they have also signed up for an e-learning course. Um, in, f for students though who are doing who have chosen to do who are not doing the e-learning courses but are just doing the remote um, they would not be able to uh, do both. They would not be able to come to school and also do, um, for example, the independent learning course or some of the courses that are offered uh, just by for Blue Water for our remote learning students. Um, those students would they, they they're going to have to decide whether they're going to do the face to face uh, or the remote learning. I'm not sure if that helps. It's a little complicated and it'll probably be very individualized based on the students. Thank you. OK, um, and next I, I, I noticed um, it, what normally happens in board meetings is that everybody gets to ask a question and then if we've gone through the list of trustees then the, the, a trustee again can ask a, another question. So although I have trustee Miller as next, in fact, I saw that there's a question here from trustee Dawson, so I'm going to put trustee Dawson ahead and then um, and then trustee Miller. So go ahead, Trustee Dawson. Thank you, Chair Johnson. My question deals with the uh, possible uh, shortage of bus drivers, and I'm wondering, do bus operators have a contingency plan if there's a shortage of drivers? Uh, through the chair, thank you, uh, Trustee Dawson. Uh, some do, and some wouldn't have as robust as a contingency plan. Certainly with some of the operators that are larger, like the Kunkels and the first student, they may have a better opportunity uh, with the number of resources that they have uh, to fill in for, for other drivers. But that is what we mentioned in the presentation is that there will be cancellations because not all of our bus operators are able to backfill sick drivers. So that's why we ask, check the delays and cancellations website on a regular basis to make sure that the buses are running. We had a shortage in bus drivers in the best of times. So as you can imagine, as the risk of illness increases, um, and if there is outbreaks, well then they could be 
there could be an impact on our bus drivers. If I could just add to that, it's uh, Lori speaking. Um, we, we are concerned about that for sure. And provincially, I know other directors have expressed the same concern because many of our bus drivers are uh, uh, retired folks who may be choosing not to come back to drive the buses. So we know that there's a potential there would be a shortage. We are concerned the same in Grain Bruce counties with the potential uh, not having enough occasional teachers at times, depending on what may happen. Uh, and that is an issue for many of the boards in the province as well. And if that were the case, uh, directors are talking about what that may look like. If we can't staff a school, it might be like an inclement weather day where we would be looking at having to make decisions around uh, potentially closing the school for that day. So this is just a bit of a heads up for trustees that we are concerned about uh, those aspects about staffing buses and potentially at times staffing our schools. Okay, so I, I, I have uh, Trustee Miller's hand up, So, and, but she also put a question in the chat and I don't think I answered it really correctly the first time. So if you have a question you're asking and um, you have a supplemental question, you know, to do with that, then when they, when the person, you know, the staff has answered the question, you can just say, I have a supplemental question related to my original question. So it has to be, you know, um, you know, built on your question. So go ahead, uh, Trustee Miller. And you're still on mute. Hmm. Uh, so I was just trying to clarify if you have a question or a comment on the subject as you're cycling through the questions. So we're trying to have a sort of an informed discussion about the topics of concern of the other trustees versus just cycling through a checkbox of questions being asked. So, you know, Katie's question about the bus, there's a question about who is going to be responsible for insurance that those kids stay one seat apart, congregate as families and all those things while the bus driver is driving. So it's relevant to that topic to have it as a sort of a separate question later and have to ping pong backwards. I, that's, you know, sort of doesn't make sense, but I don't want to disrupt the process. Um, I do have a question. I think the question that I got logged and you can correct me if I'm wrong because I was just jotting them down as we sort of cycled through things so I wouldn't forget was about the outbreak response. Is that the one that you want me to address at this point? Um, Trustee Miller, it's it's up to you. It really is. I mean, I was doing the same thing, putting questions in in the chat. I was hoping that staff would see those and and respond to them, but you, you know, you can pick whatever. OK, OK, so I'll just uh, move on to that one then um, in the presentation, which um, I am cognizant of the fact of the huge amount of work that has gone into getting us where we're at by staff and administration without a doubt, especially with um, what seems to be a constantly changing uh, position from the ministry and uh, requiring you to be relegated to a reactive position over and over again. But the outbreak response of that presentation does read more like a protocol in the case of uh, COVID uh, is presented and or confirmed. Um, a response plan for an outbreak should be different in my estimation. Um, it would be worth having a plan in advance so that we know this sort of much heralded second wave if, for example, we agreed that if there was X number of cases reported, then we agree our response to that would be to shut down schools. If there is this many amounts of cases reported, then this is how we would respond. If we had some kind of plan with clarity on how we want to address some of those things, I think it will help us um, be very quick and nimble uh, to containment, but that's just my thoughts. Uh. And I can take that one, uh, Chair Johnston. So, so thank you, Trustee Miller, for your question. You are correct. Um, the outline that you see there is a protocol. The school board's responsible for the screening, um, uh, for the ensuring that uh, people with symptoms, whether it's staff or students, are not in the school. Um, and then we are legally required 
to share that information with public health if we mm -hmm. have students or staff with COVID symptoms. Public health is uh, responsible for everything after that. So we provide them with the contact information so that they can do the contact tracing, but they will determine our next steps in, in terms of any outbreak. They will direct us as to who we need to send home, whether we need to have a school closure or several school closures, but that decision is theirs, uh, it's not ours. So that's why you see the protocol and not a full outbreak procedure. That That is public health who does that. Okay, that's really helpful to know because a lot of parents are wanting to know what the plan is. Mm -hmm. So saying that public health um, will be the one to set that direction is really, really helpful. So thank you for clarifying that. Okay, is there additional questions? Um, Chair Johnston, I think you had a question regarding um, uh, if someone has a symptom, would you, would you like me to respond to that? Yes. So if, if, a student has or a staff member for that member um, um, a matter has symptoms um, they are to be isolated the staff member typically could go home right away but the student is isolated um, the parents uh, and or guardians are called and they are to be picked up and taken home um, they uh, have to follow the um, with up with seeing a healthcare provider um, and they are directed to call an assessment centre and they're not to return to school till they are symptom free and or have a negative COVID test. I think there was another question there also that indicated what are their siblings also mm -hmm. to be removed from the school at the same time. Um, no, uh, we did ask that question of public health and public health said that um, we would provide the information to them and they would make the decision about next steps in that regard. Okay, so it's actually public health who's making the decisions. It's it, that decision, it's not the individual school boards across the province. That's correct. Thank you. You're and welcome. In Marilyn, I uh, see you, uh, Trustee McComb. Yeah, so I do have a question. I'm wondering if there is room in all of our schools to physically distance the students when they arrive. Thanks for the question, uh, Trustee McComb. Um, you will have noted that we identified that um, all of the schools are to plan for the arrival of the students. They are to ensure that they are able to have them enter the school and exit the school physically distancing. They are to ensure that they have um, set up their hallways so that people can uh, move through them physically distanced. They're to ensure that they have a process for the washroom. So we're minimizing the number of people that are in the washroom. We're putting decals on the floor outside the washroom so that they are physically distanced when they're waiting to go in. Um, and they all have a plan for their classrooms. And we've all as superintendents been working directly with uh, the staff. I talked to two um, principals today about the physical distancing in their classroom to ensure that they have the, spe the space to um, to be health, healthy and safe in the school. I, I want to add to this though, that physical distancing is not the single solitary protection mechanism in COVID-19 and preventing it. It includes a layered approach to health and safety. So it's physical distancing, masking. So if we cannot be physically distanced, we are to wear masks. It's the hand washing and, and that is hand washing and hand washing and more hand washing and that is the cleaning protocols within the school. So I don't think we can look at this just in terms of the isolated physical distancing. It's a combination of factors that will protect all the students and staff. Okay. I hope that helps. Yeah, that answers. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to add on to that, Cindy, because I did get a question from a parent um, last night, actually, about the meter distance between desks, and they got quite technical. 
about is it from edge to edge, you know, the, cl the closest edges or is it the first edges to get that meter in between? Because I know that, um, they, you know, that was the very strong recommendation from the government in terms of having um, it within the classroom, you know, the spatial allocation of one one meter. So can you speak to that? Because when I got asked the question, I thought I knew the answer and I realized I made an assumption and I think that um, there are going to be principals and teachers all making different assumptions. So it would be great if we you somebody could answer that question. Thank you, Chair Johnstone. It's uh, it's not an exact science and I will I will explain to you why. Um, when we first asked the question of Dr. Era about physical distancing, he reminded us that the World Health Organization has always indicated that one meter or three feet was sufficient, but the province of Ontario and Canada, they've chosen the two meters for the most part and um, six feet. If you read the document that was produced by SickKids Hospital mm -hmm. in terms of the school, it also indicates one meter. Yeah. So in our schools, um, principals are looking at the one to two meter, two meter is the best, but one meter with the masking, with the hand washing, uh, with no sharing of toys, which goes against everything in a kindergarten classroom <laughs> that they want those children to be able to do. Um, and, and no playing like together physical contact. So again, it's the combination of things. Um, I do know that some principals have been in classrooms and measuring specifically. Um, but remember that we have um, students who are human beings and that we're going to have to work with them and help educate them around what it looks like and sounds like to keep mm -hmm. themselves safe and well. And that includes a combination of things. Okay, and and thank you, and and I wanted to thank all the staff, and and so of course part you know reserves of you know in this motion all has to do with is that we might have classrooms in our board. It might not be a whole school. It obviously could just be a you know particular classrooms in different different school buildings where um, the class is supposed to be 24 student for students but in fact you know they can't really you know get all those students in their desks you know and be and have that physical distance and so it could be well that's where we would use some of our reserves you know to mitigate to ensure the health and safety of students and we appreciate that support. I think the other piece of this is that with the about 9% of students who have chosen remote learning, that will have an impact on class size in some classes in some schools. And we expect a, a reduction in the class size that will have um, make that distancing a little easier. Okay, thank you. And Trustee Thompson. You're muted, Trustee Thompson. And I said my most eloquent stuff there. <laughs> I'll try it again. We've been hearing so much in the media about uh, other school boards and the concerns that they're having. And we're looking in terms of uh, this motion to try and be supportive to our school board specifically and what we need to be looking at. And I guess I'm wondering from our senior admin, if you have, if you could let us know what you believe our biggest challenges are moving forward, whether it's uh, physical distancing, whether we should be encouraging our smallest students to be wearing a mask, whether we should be seeking uh, outdoor structures that could provide us uh, shelter for our students in an outdoor classroom situation, um, whether it's ventilation that we're hearing about in the media. I'm, I, As you've been working so diligently on all of this, I'm wondering if you can tell us where you think the challenges, the major challenges are for us. That, uh, if I may, it's, it's Laurie speaking. Uh, that is a, a great question, um, 
Trustee Thompson, thank you very much. I would say that Dr. R's quote that I gave earlier in the presentation just about how in Gray and Bruce counties we're in a really good place um, shows that we are much different than many of the other boards that we are seeing some of the media releases that have been coming out and some of the concerns and challenges that they are facing. Um, we we are looking at everything. I mean, uh, Superintendent Cummings spoke uh, so well tonight about our HVAC systems and how confident we are in the work that's being done there. Uh, so we are continually monitoring that, for example. Uh, we are going to, when you talk about outdoor structures, some of our schools fortunately already have some wonderful outdoor learning structures that can be accessed. And individual schools may look at different options. Um, I know that there was a conversation just around um, some out sp spaces that might protect students if they're outside in the rain, for example. Uh, could we be looking at things like that? I know that parents, when we surveyed parents, their biggest concern was definitely around the health and safety aspects. And I think for us, that's where our focus needs to be and where it has been. So just ensuring that as uh, Superintendent Lemon had talked about, just all the different strategies that we can put in place to support the health and safety aspects. Uh, I think that's where our focus really, really needs to be. And uh, we are going to do our best to ensure that that happens. My colleagues may have other comments in that regard, uh, but uh, I'm just, it's just so great to know that in Gray and Bruce County, we are in a different position than many of the other um, boards, particularly around the GTA area. Is there any other? Uh, uh, yes, if I may, I, I know that my colleagues um, have identified this in discussions that we've had, and so I, I will just um, articulate these on their behalf. So the first is when um, Paul and Wendy were presenting the section on remote learning and Lauren talked about staffing, um, they, they identified for the remote learning the number of students that we may well have and the number of teachers that we may have available. And there is a gap between the number of teachers we may have available and the number of teachers um, that we need to support those students. So that is one area where it is possible that we may need support. Um, I think the other area is probably not just a blue water concern, but is a provincial concern, and that is the, the shortage of qualified teaching staff to begin with. Uh, so that would be for emergency uh, re or occasional replacements in school on a daily basis for long-term occasional jobs so that we can avoid such things as potential school closures um, because of a shortage of staff. Thank you. OK, okay uh, Trustee Lutz. You're muted. I totally turned something else on or off. I apologize. Um, the nice thing is I think most of my questions have been answered, so thank you everyone for reading my mind. Um, a couple comments, just thank you everyone for the wonderful work and great idea about the return to school video. I mentioned in the chat that my daughter loves watching hospital tour and what to expect in your surgery videos. And they are really good and really fantastic for helping everyone feel better. So I think I think that'll be wonderful. And then just one point of clarification about our um, motion that's actually on the table, because I know we've we've circled around a lot of things. We're we're voting about the potential to use reserves. Are there any limitations on what they will be used for or will that be brought back to us as a board? Thank you. It's, uh, it's Lori speaking uh, and as Superintendent Cummings may wish to comment after my comment, but um, I, I believe that the, the motion is worded such that it does give staff the ability to use the reserves where they see fit and where it's necessary to support all of our priorities that we have identified. Um, 
Superintendent Cummings did say that we will be having, we will be bringing uh, updates monthly at our business meetings in terms of this funding. Uh, and because we realize the, the budget is uh, the oversight of the trustees. That is an important role that you play. So we need to ensure that you uh, continue to be informed in that regard and uh, we will do so. I don't know, uh, Superintendent Cummings, if you have any additions to that. Thank you, Director Walder. Uh, you said pretty much exactly what I was going to say. Uh, the only other thing I would add to that is uh, as we follow this along in the budget process, uh, where a lot of the money that is provided from the ministry comes through in the form of PPFs, um, and that shows up as a separate item within our budget uh, post budget approval of June. So uh, we we will be reporting on those as we as we receive them. Uh, but the next time we see an updated budget or revised estimates, if you will, uh, will be December 15th is when they're due. So uh, that will incorporate a lot of the changes uh, that we're experiencing or that we expect to experience over uh, the next month as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Did that answer your question, Katie? I see you nodding. Okay, I, I was going to say too that in the, in the motion itself, it talks about adoption of mi mitigation measures. So it's really speaking to exactly what, what it, it would be. And so anything that's outside of that parameter, that's not what the money would be used for. I know when um, I asked about you know, the money. It was interesting because I, I do know um, that from Superintendent Cummings that um, the comfort level of, of, you know, saying, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to use reserves. And he, um, I know that he he did speak with um, the director Wildler about, well, you know, feel comfortable, maybe $3 million, but really that going anywhere close to the four million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars i i know that our business asso would probably not be going anywhere near their system and so when i when we were looking at crafting this motion just to let you know um uh, director uh wadler went to some different boards that had different kinds of motions we wanted it to be simplistic so we didn't kind of do a kind of a list on there um, and um, and also because it's operational, uh, they they are responsible. You know, they're our administration. And um, I know that I queried <laughs> when I saw you know it, you know the top mark of two percent that I came back and said, oh, well, you know, it wasn't part of the discussion, but very much it was uh, other motions of other boards that how they worded it too. And it's for the simplicity, but they were quite clear about what that money would be used for by the administration and that we'll have monthly, you know, updates through our business committee so that we can quiz when they're, you know, if they are using that money. So I hope that that's um, okay. You know, that answered your question is um, I don't see any other hands up. Um, and I I see that I'm just I see that Terry left or she said that she had to go away, so I don't know if she's back. Um, Jennifer but I, has a question, Jen. OK, go ahead. I, I'm just asking if anyone has seen the um, the request just sent by the president of the ETFO to all of us. Um, so I believe Jennifer that has to do it, you know, and I know that um, I've had a private conversation with um, our with with the vice chair and because that is reunion related and it has to do with personnel um, and it also could do with monetary you know, contracts is that because this is an open meeting, it's, it's actually a discussion that would have to be in private. Because we can't discuss personnel in a public meeting. OK, OK. But if that's a good question, and I know that the vice chair asked me and I gave her the very same answer, I, you know. Is Did there any? Yes, so is there any further questions? And I'm wanting to see if Terry came back online. 
Me neither. So did Terry come back? OK, Katie. Trustee Lutz. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> I keep taking my hand down rather than unmuting. I'll, I'll learn how to use computers eventually. Um, we may have spoken about this before, and if so, I apologize. But just because I figure we need to make sure um, Trustee Boyd John comes back, we I figured I'd quick ask it. Have as a board, have we considered making masks mandatory for all students? It like is that on the table, off the table? Um, yeah, just where are we on that? As I know, some boards have moved forward with that. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> it's Lori speaking. Uh, we actually uh, had a conversation again with Dr. Era in that regard, and uh, he is supportive and. Uh, staff are supportive of the ministry guidance document in that regard, which says that for students in kindergarten to grade three, they are encouraged to wear masks, uh, but it is not mandatory. And that is exactly how we've approached it in our uh, protocol documents and communications out to families and parents. Thank you. Okay. And I, I noticed that trustee boy John is back, so she's back in in the in in the team meeting um it, so i'm going to ask a uh, trustee boy john do you have any questions i'm just looking in the chat i don't hear from her i i did see that she seems is is um can you just raise your hand, uh, Trustee Boy John, if you if you're actually back in the chat? Can't tell. Not seeing her. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna wait a couple of more minutes because although I thought that she was still like when I checked the participants. Could I just make a comment, Jan? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I've really appreciated tonight's meeting, um, the clarification that it gives all of us in terms of what to expect. I know that it changes on a day by day basis. Um, and I'm looking forward to all of our students and staff coming back into the schools. And I hope that we will be able to react as we see issues that uh, materialize when they're back so that we can work to keep them as safe as possible. Uh, but I've appreciated the work that's gone on in the in the background. It's huge. It's just massive. And every question you realize how much work goes behind that. So I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, um, I'm looking forward to hearing how we're making out as we move forward. OK, thank you. I have a, a question actually for for Bev. Bev, um, it, you're, if you're still on, is um, who? I was the mover of the motion, but who is the second mover? Fran Morgan. OK, super. I was concerned that it was Terry. <laughs> and, and if she's not online, then that would mess it up. So it was a, a point of clarification that I needed needed to um, to put on there. I, I am um, I don't see any other questions so i am going to put the motion back on the table um so the motion is that the blue water district school board approve admission administration staff to access up to two percent of the board's operating allocation to facilitate the adoption of mitigation measures to keep students and staff as safe as possible. Um, it was moved by uh, Trustee Johnstone and seconded by Trustee Morgan to put your hands up if you're all in favor. And that motion has passed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the staff. Thank you very much for trustees coming forward and asking really, really great questions tonight. 
I think that um, we want to make sure that obviously our students and staff are are safe and feel comfortable. I think coming back to school and it's it it is. I've heard different parents. You know, they're they're very. You know, they are very concerned. Um, I also really want to thank the staff for the huge amount of work and absolutely it it keeps on shifting and changing and and um, and I I just wanted to make sure I think all uh, you know the board of trustees wanted to make sure that our um, senior administration um, had the room to be able to pivot um, during these times. So I want to thank you and go ahead. I think. Uh, Trustee Miller and then Trustee Thompson. Unless that's not what that is. Nope, that was me forgetting to put my hand down. <laughs> no problem. And how about me you, too. Trustee? Okay, so, and I, I see there's a chat. I just want to make sure. Thank you for the information. And Terry says that thank you very much for the informative presentation and really appreciated it. Um, I'm just looking now um, that we're moving to adjournment. That the Blue Water District School Board uh, adjourn at 9.02 p.m. Can I have a mover? So a uh, Trustee Miller and Trustee Thompson, all in favor? And that's carried. Um, thank you very much everybody for coming out tonight. It was a great birthday. Happy birthday, Jan. No problem. Safe Jim. home, everybody. Yes, safe home. Uh, Jim, did you want to say something? No, I just forgot to put my hand out. <laughs> okay, so good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Chair Johnstone. Good night, everyone. Thank you, trustees. Thanks, guys.